A few shocking examples of people who were buried alive has recently come to light in a national monthly magazine story. This is only a small part of the truth. Countless thousands have been buried alive in recent weeks, and the outrage will continue until religious leaders do something to stop the practice. The amazing facts in just a moment. Hello, this is Joe Cruz of the Amazing Facts broadcast, Fact Which Affects You. You know, friends, one of the strongest, most positive statements ever made by Jesus is found in John 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I dare make the assertion today that this little word, except, is going to keep many people on the outside of the kingdom of heaven. Here we have presented two essential steps to getting admission to heaven. A man must be born of water and then born of the Spirit. Now, first of all, what does it mean to be born of the Spirit? The third verse clarifies the meaning for us very well. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being born of the Spirit then means literally that spiritual change by which a man is converted dying to sin, walking in newness of life, all those things that are involved in being born of the Spirit. Born of the water signifies that outward sign of baptism, which is a symbol of that inward spiritual change. Jesus made it even more emphatic in Mark 16, 16. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, on the basis of these statements, I do not hesitate to say that any man who has the opportunity to be baptized and refuses to be cannot possibly enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, somebody might say that the thief on the cross proves the opposite because he was never baptized, and yet Jesus told him that he would be saved. Well, the fact is, of course, that the thief did nothing except repent and receive Christ as his Savior. But that was because he didn't have an opportunity to, to do anything else. If he could have come down from that cross, he would have done many things, of course. He would have been required to do everything in the way of obeying truth in order to remain in that state of grace. He would have stopped stealing, for example. He would have made wrongs right. He would have surely been baptized. You see, God doesn't require the impossible of anybody. But if we spurn the opportunity to obey the commands of Christ and refuse to obey, we surely cannot be saved. The Bible gives us only one example of an exception to this rule about baptism in order that no one would be presumptuous in refusing to obey the commandment of Christ to be baptized. But now let's ask this question. What is the meaning of baptism anyway? Friends, it's a symbolic ordinance, and it represents something very, very significant for the Christian. And it's in the significance of the act that we find the answer to many, many questions. Notice this verse in Romans 6, 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now let's ask, why is baptism a symbol of death and burial? Who has died and who needs burying? The answer is in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, friends, listen, who is this old man and this body of sin that Paul is referring to? Well, of course, it's that old carnal nature of man. The conversion takes place in an individual, and he's born again of the Spirit of God. Immediately, a tremendous inward spiritual transformation takes place. Jesus said it was being born again. The old habits die. The sinful nature that loved to do evil things is now crucified, and a new creature emerges. And that old man of sin no longer has control because he's dead, and there's a new life in Christ Jesus. Now that the old man is dead, he must be buried. Baptism is actually that burial of the old life of sin, a symbolic act of placing that old carnal nature in a watery grave and rising to live a new life in Christ Jesus. 
Now we inquire, friends, how does baptism fulfill that symbol of death, burial, and resurrection? Why, listen, nothing could meet the type more perfectly than the Bible picture of baptism. The eyes are closed, the hands folded, the breast suspended, and the person is lowered gently beneath the water. Now, there's one point which all must understand on this subject. The act of being baptized does not work immediately and miraculously a sudden change in the individual. Uh, a man could be baptized 50 times and be just as sinful as before unless his heart had been changed. It's only when the inward spiritual renewal, the new birth, has taken place that the outward symbol of baptism has any real meaning. If there has been no death to the old sinful nature, that act of burying the old man in that water would become absolutely without any meaning or without any validity. It would be just a dead ceremony, a form that signifies nothing. Now, friends, too many people have been buried alive. I mean by that, that the, that the motions of sin were still strongly influencing their lives. They were not really converted. Religious leaders are going to have to give an answer before the judgment for the crime of burying people in baptism before that death, that spiritual death, has taken place in their lives. Well, somebody asked, how does a sprinkling of water that's practiced by many churches fit into this meaning of baptism? And the answer is simply this, friends, it doesn't fit in. The Bible presents only one kind of baptism, and surely that's the one we're interested in today. We can always find the right way by inquiring, what did Jesus do about it? What did he say about it? If we follow his example, we can never be wrong. So now let's turn to Mark 1, verses 9 and 10. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. Now notice that Jesus was not baptized by or near the river Jordan, but in the Jordan. The text says that he was coming up out of the water. He set a perfect example of baptism by fulfilling the spiritual symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. He was immersed in that water. The practice of the disciples was also in perfect harmony with the example Jesus gave. In Acts 8, the story is told about Philip's contact with that Ethiopian eunuch as he rode along in his chariot. After giving a Bible study, the eunuch asked for baptism, or after receiving a Bible study from Philip. And then Philip examined the candidate and agreed to accept him. And then in verses 38 and 39, we read these words. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now here the words are so explicit there can be no question whatsoever. Notice this expression. They went down both end of the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And then it says they came up out of the water. In order to perform the ceremony so that it would have meaning, they both got down out of the chariot into the water, and the candidate was immersed there. Now, this agrees perfectly with the method that John the Baptist used in performing baptism. We read it in John 3, verse 23. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now, please notice that John could not carry on his ministry except in certain places where there was much water for baptizing the people. If he had followed some modern customs of just sprinkling a little water, he could have carried a bottle or a jug around with him and baptized people anywhere. But he preached and met the people only at certain spots, it says, where there was much water, plenty of water. At Enon, they could go down into the water and be immersed because the River Jordan flowed by there. Now, perhaps the most incontestable proof of all lies in the original Greek word for baptize. The word that Jesus and all the Bible writers use was the Greek word baptizo. Now, friends, this word has just one meaning. The Greek lexicon of Liddell and Scott gives this meaning, to dip under water. Other lexicons say, to submerge, a rite of sacred immersion commanded by Christ. 
but never has the word been used in any other sense than this. There's no possibility of the meaning to sprinkle with water. Now, let me quote something from Dr. Conant in the book. This is quoted in the book, Systematic Theology by Strong. And this is what he says concerning this Greek word, baptizo. I'm quoting now, Examples have been drawn from writers in almost every department of literature and science. There is no instance in which it signifies to make a partial application of water by a fusion or sprinkling or to cleanse, to purify, apart from the literal act of immersion as a means of cleansing and purifying. End of quotation. So there it is, how clear the subject becomes and how completely the act of baptism harmonizes with the spiritual change that it typifies. We really can't call sprinkling baptism at all. We may call it sprinkling, pouring, or anything else, but surely, truthfully, it could not be called baptism. Now we're ready to determine who's ready for baptism. Who are the candidates and what are the prerequisites for a person being ready to be baptized? Briefly, let's consider three preliminary steps which all must take before that baptism becomes meaningful. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now here, the work of teaching was to precede baptism. People must learn the significance of this step so that it won't degenerate into some magical form or ceremony. Many times a minister must deny baptism to people because they've not received instruction about the spiritual meaning of the step they want to take. The second, the second prerequisite is found in Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus makes it very clear in this verse that a person must believe before he can qualify to be baptized. Now perhaps you're wondering about the infant baptism so widely practiced by some Christian churches. Let me ask you, friends, can a little infant be taught? Can it believe? Is it in any sense of the word an eligible candidate for baptism? Absolutely not. In fact, Peter says in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So until a person is taught, believes, and repents, he has no grounds whatsoever to be baptized. Unless the old nature is dead, there can be no burial in the water. Unless that new birth has taken place through repentance and personal acceptance of Jesus under the heart, the act of baptism is nothing but a dead form. So what about babies? Well, friends, they can't take a single one of those required steps. Not only that, but they don't even have any sins to repent of. They're innocent. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, James says. Only after coming to the age of accountability will the children be considered as guilty of transgression. And so that eliminates the babies altogether. Only adults and older children who are buried in that water can meet the true type and explanation of Bible baptism. 